Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm going to conclude the section in, uh, in um, human rights that references indigenous populations, indigenous people. Um, I do have more sections to do with respect to the overall discussion of human rights, but this will be the, the final section for um, indigenous people and indigenous population and their rights. The book that I'm using is Human Rights in the World Community. And uh, again, I, as I promised in the last discussion, I'm going to give you an example of some of the concepts that I introduced in Section 6.0. Um, the concepts were a bit sort of complex with respect to the spread of global capitalism, the perception of threat to capital, how that threat is systematically and strategically been um, uh, dealt with by further engaging capital in the acquisition of um, rarer and rarer resources within uh, primarily indigenous population and obviously the subsequent disc location, best case scenario, mass extermination, worst case scenario of indigenous people for the further spread of global capitalism. Again, um, this is a pessimistic take on global capitalism. There is an optimistic take. I've already discussed that a few hours in the past. Uh, probably four or five hours ago I discussed that. Um, maybe more. Um, so look back to that discussion to get a more balanced account. I, I would imagine that the true nature of global capitalism is somewhere in the middle. It's not all utopic. It's not all pessimistic. It's, it's a bit great. What I'm going to do, um, as I said, is conclude the analysis of the relationship between human rights and indigenous populations. And with that, let's begin with uh, section 6.1. So this human rights. And this is section 6.1. And the rights of indigenous populations. rights of indigenous populations. Again, many different topics that I could have uh, selected from to construct this at least first installment of human rights, which is now uh, probably approaching 10 hours um, of analysis, which I think is a good thing, right? The more discourse that we can have on the topic, the better both pedagogically, but I also think socially we are in recognizing the plight of marginalized you know, underrepresented, or even in worst case scenario, subaltern communities. So, um, I want to read a quote from the book directly, and this is from, from uh, one page 149 of uh, Human Rights in the World Community. And this is the quote, quote, The message indigenous people deliver is quite simple. Their ability to survive as distinct people is inextricably tied to their right to occupy their traditional territories. I read that again, right? It's a very simple concept. Their ability to survive, meaning that their survival itself depends on um, and is inextricably tied to their right to occupy their traditional territories and control their resources. So as I said before, in the last section in section six, the discussion, especially between the conflict between global capitalism and indigenous populations is the right that indigenous populations have to their territorial ancestral lands and the resources um, um, on those lands, including water rights and so on. A lot of water rights issues are arising as well. So it doesn't have, don't, don't just think sort of like sort of in the land mining extraction, but also water. Um, next, translating the rights language of the message into political correlate, indigenous people are in fact claiming territoriality. Right? They're claiming territoriality, almost in a sovereign sense, for those of you poli sci folk that are familiar with the jargon. Right? Indigenous people are, in fact, claiming territoriality, and um, an attribute normally associated with sovereign statehood, um, to which, paradoxically, only a few of them aspire. The, the point is, I don't know if I like the inclusion of paradoxically, but the point is, indigenous populations are recognizing and arguing that their survival is inextricably bound to their territorial ancestral lands 
and the resources that those lands produce for them. Global capitalism is less concerned, arguably, in this boogeyman conception, global capitalism is less concerned with the plight of the indigenous populations and more concerned with acquisition of those resources and thus the nature of the conflict. So specifically the conflict is primarily over a failure to recognize territorial ancestral lands um, as blinded by acquisition of resources, which obviously it's not the resources in and of themselves, but the resources are themselves only a means to an end for the generation of more capital. Whereas the resources for most um, within the indigenous population, and there's varying degrees of this, could be seen as an end in themselves, right? Granted, the resources might um, contribute to the sustenance of my life, right? But in global capitalism, it is undeniable that the resources are themselves a means to enter into the uh, commodity money, commodity money, commodity exchange, wherein um, products create more money, right? And there's a whole process under which that follows. Second point to recognize is um, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and I wanted to um, cite a few articles from this just to sort of reinforce the point. Well, before I do that, let me write down the first bullet point. Right? The first bullet point is the bond between, B slash is between, the bond between indigenous people and their uh, land. Right? The bond between indigenous people and their land, their resources, is one of survival. We need these resources in order to sustain our livelihood. Not including our socio-cultural, socio-political, socio-religious you know, um, concerns, but we need these resources in order to survive. The attack, of, the attack on these resources by global capitalism undermines the, the power that these in, um, indigenous communities have to protect themselves, right? So that becomes obviously exceedingly problematic. So now we turn in part two, we turn our attentions to the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And I'll just look at it as United Nations, um, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Right, too much to write, so. United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Quote, affirming that indigenous people are equal to all people. Right? Indigenous people are equal to all people. Right? The commonality that we share in personhood with ourselves and members of the indigenous right? population. Remember that I said this in the last um, last installment in section six, right, sort of, if we, just a quick review, if we look at the role of recognition, um, and specifically we situated it within, in time, with respect to, it doesn't have to be this precise, and I don't mean to get so exact, but if you look at the, the ILO, the uh, International Labor Organization, 1957, Convention 107, which had uh, assimilationist undertone to it, and then the uh, um, the subsequent nineteen, I think it was eighty nine, nineteen eighty nine, was it eighty nine? Uh, eighty nine, I think it was. I don't, I can't see it right now. Yeah, the nineteen eighty nine uh, convention one sixty nine, which talked about sort of co participation. It's a distinction in, in, in recognition, right? Recognition of the other, recognition of myself, recognition of myself and the other. Right? So indigenous people are equal. Right? There is a recognition that we are the same. Okay? Uh, while recognizing the rights of all people to be different, right? to, consider to consider themselves different, and to be respected as such, well worded, very, very, very well worded, concerned that indigenous people have suffered from historic injustices and as a result of inter alia, uh, their colonization, and um, uh, dispossession of their land, territories, and resources, thus preventing them from exercising, in particular, their right to development in accordance